and welcome to Quilt Achievement's first Markets Uncut podcast of 2024. Your weekly insight into the topics and trends that we have been exploring for you here at Quilt Achievement. Remember, so you don't miss future episodes, be sure to hit the follow button on whichever streaming platform you're listening on, or by following hashtag QC Weekly Comment on LinkedIn. I'm your host, Chris Scott, investment manager based out of our Glasgow office. And this week, I'm pleased to be joined by Richard Carter, our head of fixed interest research and fund research analyst, Carly Moorhouse. Good morning to you both. Richard, in 2023, investors were largely focused on central bank announcements and the direction of interest rates. While rates will still be a large focus in 2024, it looks as though the tensions may shift to politics as we have a big year for elections in both the UK and the US. What do you see as being the key drivers for markets this year and how much will the elections impact markets? Chris, I think I'm, you know, you're absolutely right. We spent all of last year talking about central banks and, and inflation interest, rate, interest rates. I don't think this year is going to be massively different in terms of you know, big focus on what the Fed does and says and big focus on the Bank of England because it's such a powerful force behind uh, what drives markets and, and, and markets have really priced in some pretty aggressive rate cuts now for this year. So, you know, if they're not delivered, then uh, potentially that could be um, a bit of scope for disappointment. But you're, you're right, this is a big election year. I, I don't think, I mean, we don't obviously know yet when the UK election is going to be. It's probably... You know, if you take Rishi Sunak at his word, going to be probably in sort of November time. So that's not, you know, that's still some way off. Um, and, I, and I wouldn't say there's a massive difference between the policies of Labour and the policies of the Conservative Party. So, yes, they have their own different nuances on, on economic policy and things. But um, I don't think, you know, if Labour wins or if the Tory, Tories will somehow manage to retain power, it'd be a massive shock. Um, to markets. I think that the US election clearly is the one to watch because that has the uh, power to make much more of a difference um, given some of the geopolitical challenges in the world at the moment, you know, with you know China, Ukraine, what's going on in the Middle East and the outcome of the US election is massive. And we obviously don't know who's going to be, you know, which what the candidates are going to be. We think it could be Biden, Trump, but uh, equally that could change. So I do, I do think politics have a big impact on markets, but it could be towards the end of the year rather than um, in the first half, I think. Lots to look out for then. Thanks, Richard. Carly, our listeners will be aware that strong equity markets in the US last year were driven by a handful of mega cap tech stocks, dubbed the Magnificent Seven. Can you summarize why they had such a strong year? And if you feel this will continue into 2024, or do you believe that more attractively valued economies will outperform this year? Yeah, so the Magnificent Seven, for those that aren't aware, are seven mega cap tech companies, um, which have had a pretty amazing year, really, off the back of excitement around artificial intelligence. So these companies are Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, Tesla, Meta and NVIDIA. So AI was obviously a very hot theme last year. And I'm sure you all remember there was a period where everyone was um, talking about chat GPT and, and trying it out. And and, you know, these companies play um, a key role in the development and use of AI. So they all perform particularly well simply off the back of that last year. The weakest of the um, seven companies was Apple, which was up 48 percent last year, while chipmaker NVIDIA led the pack with an increase of close to 240 percent. Equity market concentration in the U.S. is now at its highest level in the last 40-ish years, um, with these larger stocks making up nearly 30% of the US market. So while the US stock market ended the year up about 26% last year, a lot of this was driven by the Magnificent Seven, as you mentioned, and you know their outsized influence on the index. As if you look at the equally weighted US index, the returns were actually closer to 14%. So you know, as these stocks have continued to perform well, their market caps have obviously um, continued to grow with, with the seven having a combined market cap of um, $12 trillion. Um, and obviously this strong performance has had an impact on valuation. So you know, the US market is um, trading above the average levels of the last 30 years on a, a forward earnings basis. However, again, if you look at the equal weighted version of that index, it's trading at the lower end of the average 30 year range. 
So quite a difference. And I, I think this is what's extremely key here. You know, those with um, exposure to these names have done very well in the last year. With stocks up double and, and triple digits, um, I don't think it would be unreasonable to think that we could see some profit taking here, especially if the macro backdrop remains more favorable. Which brings me on to um, the second part of your question here about the broadening out of market returns. And I think the fact that compared to a year, you know, 18 months ago, we are now at a place where inflation has caught, fallen quite a bit across most major economies. And the question is no longer um, you know, where will rates peak, but when will they start to fall? And this has led to much more optimism relative to, say, a year ago. If you remember, as, as the yield curve inverted, the view was that the US would go into recession. But so far, despite its aggressive tightening cycle, which um, it looks like we're past now, they, they've avoided that. And, and with Jay Powell's pre-Christmas conference providing a much more dovish tone, that soft landing scenario looks much more likely today. And you know, if we're looking at a broad-based global recovery, with that backdrop, you would expect to see more of a broadening out of returns. And we started to see that in the last few months of, of 2023, as investors moved away from the Magnificent Seven and started to take a closer look at other parts of the market, which had all been ignored for the better part of a year. But you know, the Magnificent Seven earnings are expected to grow by more than 30% next year, while the rest of the market is just high single digits. So there is still optimism for these companies, and we could see these names continue to do well. But I think a lot of that is already reflected in prices. If you're optimistic on a broad-based um, global recovery in the stock markets, then it seems unlikely that the big tech companies would all collapse while everything else does well. But I think um, you know, perhaps being more active and selective within that seven, you know, seeing which of these can actually deliver on those earnings expectations, then also looking outside of that and diversifying away into um, you know, better priced opportunities. You know, many have cited the smaller mid-cap space as, as very interesting given valuations today. Um, but it's not just in the US where there are opportunities. Um, I also cover Asian and emerging markets. Um, and you know, while there are obvious reasons for the weakness, you can't deny that China is looking very cheap today. The discount of China to US markets is the largest in over a decade, so you know, close to 50%. And other emerging markets are also in a good place. You know, for example, Brazil starting to cut rates, um, and there's quite a bit of optimism there. And despite valuations, many are still uh, very positive on India. We actually just came back from a research trip to Japan and investors there were very optimistic. And we certainly felt the weakness of the currency. And it was just fascinating to hear how the Tokyo Stock Exchange reforms are impacting businesses across the country. So globally, we, we certainly aren't short of opportunities. And of course, it is hard to know exactly what will happen. But you know, should the macro continue to move in the right direction, you would expect to see investors start to uh, look outside the Magnificent Seven. Thanks, Carly. And you touched on some of the really strong returns that the, the Magnificent Seven had in 2023. And because of these really strong uh, numbers, a lot of observers have been drawing comparisons to these companies and the dot-com bubble. Do you buy into these comparisons? Um, I wouldn't say we're, we're looking at exactly the same thing. Um, there are, of course, some obvious parallels, such as the concentration of the larger stocks in the indices, the outsized market cap of, of these largest companies, and I guess the fact that you have one theme that is, is driving these companies higher. But I think what's also key here is that you know, these aren't all AI companies whose earnings you know, hinge on solely um, you know, AI becoming the next biggest thing. Um, and more importantly, these companies are profitable. And not the same can be said for the companies that were rallying in the dot-com bubble. So I think that this is um, you know, a really important fact. It's not to say that the Magnificent Seven can't or, or won't fall because um, you know, we did see a pullback towards the end of last year, but I don't think that necessarily means we're looking at a stock market crash. You know, these are well-established, high-quality businesses with good balance sheets, and, and that's also why investors like them, not just for their AI involvement, um, which certainly was a tailwind last year, but you know, more because in an uncertain environment as well, uh, which we were faced with last year, you, these are the types of businesses um, that you want, you know, the ones that can withstand a downturn. So for this reason, I don't think we're looking at a dot-com bubble scenario, but I do think we could see a pullback in, in some of these names as, as valuations are looking a bit stretched in some places. And, um, you know, that's where investors would likely look to take profit to recycle into some of you know, those better value opportunities that I mentioned before. 
um, obviously should the macro environment continue to provide a decent tailwind. That's great, thanks Carly. And lastly, Richard, do you believe that central banks have been successful in suppressing inflation whilst not restricting economies too much or does this remain to be seen? Yeah, good question. I think a little bit remains to be seen. I think we should we should also be, you know, fairly clear that you know central banks have sort of done their bit in terms of raising interest rates to try and get inflation down. But actually, a lot of the drivers were sort of outside their control in a way in terms of sort of energy prices and some of the um, sort of post cover uh, post COVID kind of bottlenecks which have gradually unwound. Um, but yeah, certainly they they've sort of seemed to have done a good job so far, and it doesn't that hasn't been a the, you know the sort of bit deep recession or anything that's you know some people were concerned about um you know as interest rates uh, started to climb so i think i think this you know we talked earlier about what's going to be the story of, of, of this year um obviously you know, politics as we said but it really will be this issue with central banks are they you know have they done enough on the inflation front and are they able to start cutting interest rates this year uh, in a way that sort of preserves economic growth and avoids the recession. So we've had, you know, with the early part of the answer is they've done done a good job, but there's still a little bit of work to go. And it's important that they don't keep rates too high for too long, because if they do, potentially, um, that could tip us into recession. So I think on, on that kind of depends a lot of how markets will do this year. Well, thank you both for those great insights as we look forward to what's going to be another busy year in stock markets in 2024. To our listeners, we'll be back next Tuesday. In the meantime, head over to our website, www.quilterchiviate.com, where you can read the accompanying market overview as well as subscribe to our weekly comment newsletter. You can also review the podcast from wherever you're listening or get in touch with us via our social media pages. Finally, we are pleased to announce this year's Advisor Roadshow, Politics, People and Planning, Financial Advice in 2024. At the Roadshow, we will deep dive into the domestic and global political environment, the impact on markets, vulnerable clients, building relationships with the wider family of clients, and how all of these can be tackled with expert planning. You can find the registration link for the Roadshow in events section of our website, www.quiltergeviate.com. And that's it for today. So thank you, Richard and Carly, for your time and to all of you for listening. See you next time.